Today we have Anna Paulina Luna, who's running for a House seat in Congressional District 13 in Florida. Welcome, Anna, and congratulations on winning your primary last week. Thank you. We're super excited. As you know, Florida 13 is a redistricted open red seat. So we're very excited for Republican turnout this fall. One of your major platforms that you list is fighting big tech. And I wanted to know your thoughts on what Mark Zuckerberg had to say on Joe Rogan's show just last week. The problem that we're seeing right now, especially with people running for office, is that the laws are actually outdated with Congress, right? So it only covers down on um, print, television, and radio. And because of that, we're basically seeing that candidates like myself are actually not being given a fair platform. Mark Zuckerberg goes back and forth. We know at one point that he was basically pretending to play nice with President Trump, and then he turned around and stabbed him in the back. So I really don't like Mark Zuckerberg. I think that they have too much power, and I think that part of our goal and objective for this incoming freshman class of congressmen and women is to really hold big tech accountable. During this conversation with him, it was really that the FBI was telling Mark Zuckerberg not to post about Hunter Biden. Do you think that the FBI is corrupt, and what can we do to change that? I think just like the military, the FBI has top-down leadership. I think that there are some good men and women, but unfortunately, because the leadership has become partisan and thus corrupt, it's actually just kind of ruining the entire organization as a whole. The fact is, is that no organization, especially taxpayer-funded organizations, should ever basically leverage those systems against the American people. And I think with what we saw, in addition to not just Mark Zuckerberg, but remember, it was also Twitter that helped bury that story. And basically, when polled later on, many Democrats said had they known about that, they would actually not have voted for Joe Biden. And so I think it's basically, um, if you want to call it collusion, but at the end of the day, the fact is, is that this should have never happened. It really stained and I think brought dishonor upon the reputation of the FBI. And I do think that Congress needs to open up an investigation into who on the back end from this administ current administration with the Bidens are actually asking for this to be done, because frankly, it's a gross abuse of power. You mentioned globalism in some of your ads and speeches, including your primary night win speech. What is the threat to America in terms of globalism? And what do you think America's trajectory will be if we don't make some major changes right now? Well, look, it's no joke and no secret that by 2030, the Communist Chinese Party is trying to become the number one world superpower. We here in the United States and Western culture stand in the way of that, but the Communist Chinese Party wants total domination and global control. Um, a lot of this is what they're engineering now. We can see it. It's almost 1984 type tech surveillance with social media apps, with cameras within their normal populace. And basically what we're finding now is the more that we shift focus from the American people onto a global market, onto what's best for the global community, the less freedom that we have as a country. And I think it's incredibly important for people not to shy away from this term, but to hit it head on because the more that we speak out, the more that not just we set fires of ideas here in the United States, but we set that idea around the country or around the world. We saw this happen in 2016 and in 2020 with President Trump. You saw countries like India and Poland really rally behind this idea of loving your country. And I think the more that we as a country focus on what China is doing, the more that we can hit that head on. But it's it's no mistake that China is also using this quote unquote green movement to really, I think, brainwash the American people and basically thinking that we as the, uh, as the United States need to economically hinder ourselves. Meanwhile, China is basically destroying the environment and really I think beating us in the manufacturing and production aspect. So this is multifaceted. I think it largely has to do with China, but I think the more that we as legislators speak out against this, the more that we educate the youth of our nation, I think we have a pretty good chance at stopping it. What is an, what you think that we can do as a solution to that, that is also not gonna put in the Green New Deal? How can we help and conserve our energy? 
Well, I think really the angle is one, conservatives and, and Republicans have been really falsely branded as being anti-environment. I think part of our platform is, you know, being a green conservative, being someone that wants to conserve our environment for future generations. But really when we're talking about this green movement, you know, a lot of people that are talking about wanting to save the environment say, okay, well, we need to do it through electric vehicles. The problem with that is that one, electric vehicles, after they're actually no longer good, the batteries become toxic, and also two, China owns a majority of the lithium deposits, which are actually responsible for battery production, right? So all we're doing is really shipping our industry and putting our entire country on an electric grid that can be easily hacked and is actually a national security issue. So if you want my opinion, if you really want to help the environment, not only do we need to get back to American energy independence, right? We have some of the best standards for the environment in the entire world, but also too, we don't have to go to places like Russia or Venezuela or even other countries to get gas and oil production because we have it right here at home. And so the more that we send our manufacturing overseas, the more damage that we do for the environment when we can just do it right here and also maintain our status quo as a world superpower. And so I'm very actually big on that branding. I can tell you that we can start, especially in my district, talking about the oceans. My community largely depends on it. However, China's actively destroying it. And so I think the more that we make this conversation and we really take back and I think occupy this space on the national scene in regards to talking about energy conservation and the environment, I think that that's the more that we're going to start to, I think, win the culture war in that aspect. Speaking of China, what are your thoughts on the Chinese nationals buying up land in the United States? I think it should be absolutely illegal. I think one of the biggest concerns I have, especially being that I'm an Air Force veteran, is the fact that a lot of these big corporations were buying up land around strategic military sites that we have here in the United States. As you know, China has actively been infiltrating our government. We had Dianne Feinstein, who had a Chinese driver that was a spy for 20 years. You had Eric Swalwell and Fang Fang. I mean, that's not a joke. The fact is, is that there's an ongoing intel war every single day. They are act actively going after after members of Congress, members of Senate that are legislating and working to, I think, really help stop what the Communist Chinese Party is doing. But they're also to surrounding our strategic sites to gather intelligence. And so the American people need to be aware of this. I know because I'm doing the interview with you guys, the left is probably going to say that I'm being anti-Asian. I'm not being anti-Asian. I'm not being anti-Chinese. I'm being anti-communist. And I think that, that we need to actually talk about this issue, not treat it like it's some 1984 conspiracy theory. It's very real and a very big problem. The left always spins things. We saw that when you talked out about the border, they called you basically anti-Hispanic, even though you are a second generation immigrant from Mexico. How do you feel as a Hispanic woman running as a Republican? I think that it's really, really sad how we've blatantly seen the leftist media, I think, attack Hispanic candidates. You know, it wasn't just myself. It was Myra Flores. It's Catalina Lauf. It's many conservative Hispanics. They automatically will try to, especially as women, they try to say that we're crazy, which, you know, ironically enough, the left likes to promote women's rights, right? Or they like to say that they're the face of women's rights. And yet the first thing that they'll do is try to mentally attack us, make comments on our physicalities, um, whether it's trying to discredit our platforms you know the most upsetting thing as a hispanic candidate running for office is the fact that i have blatantly witnessed this stigma and this stereotype of what it means to be hispanic by the left i've posted many of these um, articles on my social media on my instagram account where they've actually talked about what it means to be hispanic in regards to your skin color and frankly, what that reminds me of is really the brown paper bag test that was used during segregation here in the United States, where they would basically hold up a brown paper bag and see if someone from the black community was considered passing. And that's really what they're trying to do with the Hispanic community. If you are not brown enough, you are not Hispanic enough. And I think that that is a very toxic, um, not good trait for the left to be pushing. It's frankly rooted in, I believe, racism. But, you know, as a whole, I will continue to advocate and talk about border security because people forget that we have one of the biggest human rights abuses happening at our border every single day. And they, instead of making this a humanitarian issue, they're making this a partisan one. And as Hispanic women, especially, we need to be advocating and speaking out against this. 
Following your primary win, your Democratic opponent put out an attack ad against you about your views on abortion, dubbing you a pro-life extremist. This is something that we've been seeing across the country with Democrat ads after Roe versus Wade. What are your thoughts on abortion and do you condemn your opponent for putting this ad out? Yeah, so my opponent, the Democrat that was um, busy basically praising Joe Biden for his withdrawal of Afghanistan, to put it in perspective with just how out of, ta out of touch and just blind this guy is. Um, anyways, he put out an attack ad saying that I was a pro-life extremist. So does that mean I'm a pro-baby extremist, a baby protector? I mean, the fact is, is that I am a minority woman. I believe in life. It's no secret that Planned Parenthood was targeting black and minority communities and was really founded in eugenics. And so it's very ironic to see that this man, a white male, is actually attacking me and then blanket labeling me when in actuality that even a majority of people that are pro-choice do not agree with this platform that taxpayer dollars should be funding abortions up to nine months. I mean, that's completely absurd. And the fact is, is that my background is in science. I actually have a STEM degree. I've taken the developmental biology courses. And even when Roe v. Wade was overturned, the media lied to the American people. It was never going to quote unquote outlaw abortion. It gives it back to the states to decide, which is exactly where it needs to be. And given the scientific evidence we've had in breakthroughs since when that initial ruling was done in the 70s, it's definitely going to be important for the scientific argument to be forefront of this discussion. And the fact is, is that I believe life begins at conception. There's scientific backing for that. And I can have those arguments. You know, I can tell you that I myself, uh, my mother was actually asked to have an abortion and she stood by me and really chose to have me. But, um, you know, more personally, my husband was a byproduct with his twin brother of an unconsensual event. And, you know, these people that advocate for abortion, especially those, you know, with circumstances, I think that these people don't fully understand that you could be walking next to a complete stranger. And that person is never going to tell you that they are a byproduct of rape. They're never going to tell you that they were raped. They're never going to tell you that they might be a byproduct of incest. What they try to do is they use these arguments that are literally, I think they make up less than maybe 1% of abortion cases. And they try to make that the general cause for why they believe a certain thing. And I can tell you that if my husband's biological mother did not make the decision that she did, I wouldn't have him today. My husband later on went forward to receive a bronze star and purple heart. And, you know, for all arguments, he's, he's literally a war hero. So, you know, we stand by our convictions. I will stand up to any, you know, abortion industrial complex on that argument. And frankly, I hope that if you're watching this and you are pro-life that you donate to my campaign, because clearly this guy is um, a little bit bizarre with his attack ads against me for, from a life perspective. You and your husband are both from the military and we're coming just on a year after Joe Biden left troops in Afghanistan. As a military family, how did that make you feel? You know, seeing that, I can tell you that we actually lost a few of our friends over there. My husband was shot over there and the Biden administration, the way that they did it, you can see that I think it was maybe weeks prior that they were talking about the gender um, identity training that the military needed to receive. I mean, they it just should show you how out of touch they were with strategic planning versus pushing a woke agenda in the United States military. It's disturbing. I think that leadership needs to be held accountable. But more importantly, I actually have one of those service members that was killed in action, his mother, uh, Ryan Christian Canal. She actually lives here in Pinellas County. And I can tell you that I actually went to a memorial march with his family and I actually got to know them. And it's never easy for these families to suffer the catastrophic loss that they grow through. But it's worse and it's made worse when leadership fails to accept accountability for their actions. And the fact is, is that the Biden administration, even at one of the memorials that they had over, um, I think it was Veterans Day, they actually asked the mother of Ryan um, something along the lines of, I hope you're not still mad. And that was the first interaction that Joe Biden had with one of these families. So, you know, what they did was wrong. It was hard for many service members. The uh, suicide lines went off the hook. 
with people that felt that their service had been done in vain and it didn't need to happen like that. But, you know, come this November and come in 2024, the American people need to remember that because there's many of us that have sacrificed and sometimes our family members don't come home. The Biden administration has really been failing Americans recently with so many different acts. I mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act earlier, and just recently he decided to cancel student debt for people that actually make up to $125,000. What is your response to that controversy? You know, I've had this debate with people to include family members that have student loans. And here's my argument. You know, you can have your school paid for, but you have to work for it. I did it. I had no way of paying for college. I joined the military and ultimately graduated from school with my degree debt free. You know, I had to serve. I had to work hard, but I did it. The fact is, is that it is not fair to have people that made those sacrifices to not take the debt out, pay for those that basically decided to go to college and made those irresponsible decisions. Now, I also caveat that with this, you know, these organizations like Fannie Mae that are actually, I think, going after some of these students with predatory loans, understanding that they might be from a lower socioeconomic status, that they are getting degrees that might not be useful. You know, they poo poo trade schools, yet these they push degrees that you might not necessarily be able to use in the real world after you graduate from college. And so I think that this needs to all be taken into account. But to say that people that, you know, might be in remote Idaho or remote Montana, that they have to pay for the loans of people living in New York City, that's simply not fair. And also, I believe I saw something recently that said that if you do take the payout for the um, student loan forgiveness, that's considered taxable income. I don't know if people know that. So all it's doing is contributing to the inflation that we currently have in this country, and it's not actually solving the issue. You have spoken about that crime has impacted your childhood and really you got stuck in the poverty system, but the military took you out of that. What can you suggest to people to get them off supporting the government so much when they're stuck in that system? Uh, well, you know, I'll explain it to you from this perspective. So um, my dad, um, he ended up getting sober really over the last 10 years, but from a majority of my life, my dad really struggled for with a methamphetamine addiction and he was in and out of the picture. And I can tell you that because of that, right, I didn't really have a father in the home. My mom is a single mom and yes, we did struggle. You know, I didn't know any different though. And I think it's so incredibly important for people to understand, especially legislators that, you know, when you're talking to someone that might be in that system, maybe they don't know that there's another way out. Part of the reason why I share my story is because I understand that someone somewhere might be hearing my story and might be able to understand that you might be dealt a bad um, hand of cards, but that you can work in this country, you can work your way out of a very bad situation. And you really only find that here in America and that's the American dream. And so, yes, by joining the military, I was able to have the stability and structure that I really lacked at home. And thus I was able to excel and now I'm running for Congress and it's very likely that I am the next representative for Florida 13. But you know, these legislators that try to push big government, all it does, maybe it's with best intentions, maybe it's more nefarious, but it doesn't actually help the individual. And I will always tell people that you as a person, will be able to make decisions and take care of yourself better than the government can. I know I've been in it, you know, I've had to go through, you know, food for less and, and I've had to literally be there while my parents were paying with food stamps. I've had to literally go to Thanksgiving church, you know, giveaways where they're basically doing potlucks because that's really all my dad could afford. And so I know what it's like, but I can tell you that in no circumstance would I ever advocate for big government helping me because I was able to work my way out. And I think that that's the real true argument with capitalism and free market capitalism that that is that you can really find a way, work hard and, and, and take yourself out of a bad situation. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, we hope that you can come back even closer to the general election. Thank you so much. And if you want to donate, you guys can head over to voteapl.com. Any donation amount counts.